All right, welcome to part three of this week's Yawa, where we have already spent part one and part two answering your questions and updating uh, the world on Standing Stone. Or at least the people that subscribe to our channel. So if you don't subscribe, subscribe so you don't miss out on all of the announcements that we make to our YouTubers. Smooth, baby. Yeah. Like that. All right, so in part two, we kind of finished with a cliffhanger, if you will. Not so much cliffhanger, just a half-answered question. We ran out of time. We did. So Ethan, it was all Ethan's fault. He got really long-winded. Didn't say anything. <laughs> but we are here, and I want to finish answering this question because it is a a question to, to answer all questions. It's a uh, given. It's a uh, given. It's essentially a question that gets answered ask a lot and that is uh, to sit or not to sit with a pointing dog so we've talked about a few things but essentially what it comes down to to kind of jump through the question as it was asked Mm -hmm. there part one of that question was to sit or not sit yes okay 100 percent. you can teach sit no problem and then the next part in there and we kind of covered the the first part of that the next part was she said you have somebody who has a dog that sits on point Yes, and then another person that they train with that insists. No, 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 no. Part two. Let's part two. Okay, so part two. We have a dog that sits on point, right? Yes. Have you ever seen that before? Yes. Like not so, on point through a uh, steadiness sequence. Through, through a steadiness sequence. So this yeah, is yeah, where yeah. that's what I'm getting at. Is this is the clarification that I'm looking for? I don't know that I've honestly ever seen a dog that comes in. <sighs> locks up and then sits down automatically. I don't know that I have no, specifically seen that. It's always in relation to something else. Something that could be continue or could be directly correlated with pressure. Yeah. In a sense of a steadiness sequence or a the the presence and pressure of a handler. Yes. Can force a, a sitting situation. Like you start flushing so the dog locks up on point, they're standing. You come in as handler and start kicking around trying to find a bird, and then the dog sits down. And then there's the other side of it where I've seen um, setting dogs, and sitting is different than setting. Yes, setting is their front half gets really low and intense. And the whole body kind of comes down. Crouching Have, down. Cr- crouching tiger, hidden dragon. Yeah. Loading. I like to call it loading when Nick's does it. He does a little bit of it. It's it's intensity. He, ooh, like I'm ready. I'm getting that back foot Loading. dug into the blocks, and I'm because this bird is coming out, and I'm going for it. But uh, so it really depends, and I would love the opportunity if you have a chance to pull out your iPhone, make sure that it's turned sideways so that we can see everything that's going on there. This way, it really People makes gotten, the videos. I think small. with. I think it's Snapchat and Instagram's fault. Yeah, screw you, Instagrammer. And they and people get in the habit of flip it sideways. We can see we can so see much so more. So much more. Yep. So um, I would love to see a video of your sitting training companion, uh, and then we can evaluate more of what's going on. If they're okay with it, and you're okay with it, and everybody's okay with it, you should shoot just a training sequence, um, one or two or three birds or whatever the whole deal is. You know, we're talking a five to 15 minute video somewhere in that vicinity, a couple birds, two, three birds, send it to us. We will look at it. We'll talk about it and we'll tell you all of the things we see and don't see. Okay. Heck, heck, we might even react to it. We, we reaction. Yeah. Um, so part three, what do we got there? This is a good question. No, no, no. Part oh. three, we're the same question. This is the last part. I the, thought we had The trainer about that it. insists oh. in also has a trainer that a person that they train with that insists Mm -hmm. that you should not teach them to point. Okay. You should not teach them to sit. What? Isn't that what we're talking about? Sitting on (laughs) point. Yes. I train with someone who insists you should not teach them to sit. Yeah. You said should not teach them to point. Play it back. (laughs) Play it back. That's what she said. I know a hundred percent. That's what she said. But you should not teach them to point. Okay, so we are here. We're we're talking about your your friend now that says don't teach sit. I'm insistent on the fact that you don't teach sit. Okay, um, it's it, like you've heard of old wives' tales, right? There's old bird dog trainer tales too. 
And some of those things get passed down from generation to generation or trainer to trainer or whatever. And a lot of people don't really know the rhyme or reason to it. And all it comes down to is what Kat had kind of touched on in the sense. And so this is quick, but it's just a sense of not having a true understanding of the difference and not having um, solid expectations and some combination of a default to sit and then having and most importantly, not having a quality way to actually teach whoa. People a lot of times only utilize pressure, um, positive punishment, and some form of the combination of the above to teach it. It's just like we just slap some rigmarole on you, a suitcase handle or a half hitch or um, we throw a collar on you and we put you on a barrel or a post or a platform or a, we do all of these things that are strictly almost exclusively positive punishment based. And that's not a great way to teach. Punishment based training is not ideal. It's okay once you have an understanding and you are reinforcing or building consistency, it's better in that situation. But we need reinforcement based training. So it's it's one of those things that probably don't have an ideal way of teaching or they weren't taught a good way to teach. And um, the way that we teach puts a very strong understanding of the difference between the two and you're better off and you can definitely, you can definitely teach both. So to sit or not to sit, long story short, sitting. teach both. Yeah. Sitting is fine. Yeah. So next question from Nicholas Moody. Uh, I bet you got that one right. I think so. I, that one was an easy one to pronounce. Rock and roll. But there's not an easy dog name to pronounce in this question. So, give me, give me a shot. What do we got? My family will be getting a new puppy mid September after losing our Vishla of 12 and a half years. I'm sorry to hear that. I can uh, say I'm Vishla. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. We will be getting a Brock. It's never easy to lose one. They become such a big part of the family. And whether they're 12 or 15 or 18 or two, or eight months, it's it's hard. It's very, 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 yes. very hard. Definitely it is. We will be getting a Brock D. Oh, you're, you're all on that one. <laughs> you never even heard of this. Brock producer. Look this look, look dog this up. up and and get a pronunciation. Okay, a, I'm working on it. A Brock D. Arvern. I'm going with that. When charging the clicker. Can multiple family members participate in a single meal training session? I have a nine and six year old daughter that want to help my wife and I with training. Thank you for your content. Super informative. Well, you're very welcome. Yes, everyone can be involved in your training sessions. I think that that's an important thing for everyone to become involved. That way your puppy will learn that, hey, they have to listen to everyone. Everyone is somebody that is important. But in the beginning stages of clicker training, let's say you're charging the clicker. You need to a, be able to keep the momentum of the training session going. You're trying to build an association and an understanding that the click is a good thing. And so having multiple people trying to be involved in that as well as like handing off the clicker and losing the momentum of the session wouldn't necessarily be what I would recommend. I would say taking turns, Watching some of our training videos so that your, you know, daughters understand the process of how the training session should go and then stepping in if need be, but having each of them take a turn and say, okay, breakfast is your six-year-old's chance to do the training session and dinner is your nine-year-old's chance to do the training session with you supervising, of course. And then as your puppy gets a better, stronger understanding um, of clicker training and then learning behaviors, you guys can both or all be involved in the training sessions. Especially when you start recall, that'll be really good where they can call your puppy back and forth. Puppy, puppy, puppy goes one way. Then the other daughter gets to call the puppy the other way and click and reward them for complying with that cue and exhibiting that behavior. You, you got a pronunciation there? I do Producer? not have a pronunciation. It's a male Brock D. It's French. So if you could... Speak France at us. Um, Brock de Auvergne. Auvergne. Uh, it sounds better than I'm going with I that. Um, but it is, uh, they, they are cute. I mean, they 
See, that one has a shorter tail. Most of the pictures that I've seen have long tails. Um, like that one. It looks... They look like a short-haired setter-ish. Not, not setter. They just look... They look like um, Brock Italianos. I mean, droopier, houndier. They look... I mean, similar short hairs. Just like... Uh, but different color. I don't think that Brock Italianos come in black. Do they not? No. I'm not an aficionado on all the coloring mm. options in those some, more obscure breeds. Some tails are dark, but they are French. But but Brock Francais can both have short tails and long tails, just like short hairs. Some DKs don't have docked tails. Mm. Now that is another video. Ooh. DK I've, versus this GSP. Is I've, I've only seen um, black ones. Oh, maybe that's part of it. Yeah, I've I've only seen. We are going to have to do ones. some research on this because I'm curious now. Mm-hmm. Ooh, you can get a um, lab mix with a however that's pronounced. Okay, next question. It looks like they're. Uh, I'm I'm definitely interested in more information on this breed, but I've only seen. Shoot us some. Listed. Shoot us over some info. Yeah, I'm only seeing black and white here. That's cool. Let us know what you know, Nicholas. We want to know. We want to know. So moving on to the next question from Jacqueline Smith. I have two intact females and one intact male in my home that I do not intend to breed. Oofta. When the females are in season, I mm-hmm. locate them to a different part of the house and give them a different yard but my male still has a hard time with constant whining and crying. Any suggestions besides fixing them to help him out? Katie, bar the door. Isn't that a thing? What? I don't know. I would say um, I would would take your male and place him in the next county. Yeah, so options. If you don't want to fix them, first of all, if you're not planning on breeding – it honestly would be healthier for your females to be spayed if they are. Age again? Didn't didn't give an age. I yep. said if they are okay. over a year that. old. Um, it sounds like they've at least had a heat cycle since uh, you've already experienced this with your male. Mm-hmm. Crying and whining constantly. Um, so our recommendation honestly would be spaying them. How do our boys deal with it? They get a little worked up. They get more worked up, but it's not like they whine and cry and howl all the time. No, but the difference would be our males do breedings. I mean, that's part of the program. They're stud dogs for our breeding program. And so they learn when the females truly need to be bred. This is very true. So Nick's won't even, I mean, you could let him out with another female and he would be like, he might sniff her and give her a lick. Yeah, you're not ready yet. No. Give her another 48 hours and I'll be interested and then I'll only be interested for like three to five days maybe so um, that might be part of it but a recommendation could be to got a friend of the family or a trainer or even a boarding facility that you could have your mail boarded during or trained or visiting a family or friend member during your female's heat cycles so that it doesn't drive them up the wall and I just want to mention, you do keep them separate, but we have heard horror stories of males that have dug through walls to get to females to get them bred while they're in heat. That's actually how I met my, uh, what I would consider my best friend. Yeah, that's that's how uh, we met Rich, Mm -hmm. with Arthur. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Arthur was created by digging a hole through the laundry room wall. By Maverick, digging a hole through the laundry wall yeah. to get to Bella. Well, Arthur didn't create himself by digging a hole through the wall, but yes, yes. Maverick dug a hole through the laundry room wall and got her done. I don't understand why Bella was in the living room in heat romp- romping around. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I'm not sure, but they were kept separate and the sheetrock didn't do enough. Let's go with that. He was determined. Mm-hmm. So keep in mind, there are options. Ultimately, if you don't plan on breeding, spaying your females would be my go-to answer. Absolutely. 
So this is a good question from We Kel- haven't had a bad question yet. That's because I pick them. And you guys ask them. So you guys have some really good questions. And if you are have made it this far and you're through parts one, two, and three, or maybe just part three and haven't seen parts one and two, go back and watch them. Or if you have a question right now, you'd like to ask it, throw it in the comments below. And because you are now 75% of the way into this video, smash the like button. And stick it out for just a few more minutes so you can type finished in the comments. So question from Kelly Purrier. You talk a lot about having a bold and confident dog. I'm really curious what tips you would offer to develop some of that bold and confident behavior for someone who lives in a city environment. Mm. My puppy Jackson is eight weeks and has only been home for two days. I recognize he's adjusting. He has moments of romping through the yard confidently and then prolonged periods of time of being directly at my ankle. I know he needs to acclimate and I need to know what my options are to encourage and maintain bold and confident behavior. Last name pronounced Purrier. Hey, thank you. I wish I would have read that whole bottom part before I pronounced your name, but I think I got it pretty close. You were really close. Um, do we hear a breed? I missed that. Uh, no, no breed. No breed. Puppy Jackson. Puppy Jackson. So first of all, uh, I want to say a couple things. One, it's awesome that you are reaching out. It's awesome that you have a new puppy. And it's even more awesome that you are thinking forward in the fact that they need to be bold and confident and well-adjusted. Yeah, the fact that you followed along and are listening to some of the things that we suggest. I'm and- curious to know what breed because that's going to make a big difference in personality and general characteristics. And maturity. I mean, there are sure. some breeds that are slower to mature than others overall. Um, but in general, your puppy, like you said, has only been home for a couple of days. They're still adjusting the fact that he is interested in going out and exploring a little bit, but still pretty dependent on you is very, very normal. Uh, usually our short hairs don't get to that point of independence and boldness to the sense that they're ready to just disappear into the hinterlands, checking stuff out for themselves until they've been around for a couple weeks. I mean, usually maybe 12 weeks. And that's when we talk about, hey, 12 to 16 weeks is typically when we recommend start collaring conditioning. If you've got that puppy that has started being bold and confident and a little more independent because they're going away, doing their exploring, not wanting to come back when you recall them. So they'd be ready for that because they're bold and confident. Now, if you've got a dog that's a little slower to mature, uh, we just worked with a little rock Francais at a training seminar. So not just, but it's been a while. And she was 12 weeks old at the time. And she was definitely a little bit slower to mature. And, and they're on Patreon. And I've gotten yeah. to see little she's kind of turned into a wild banshee, which is a good thing. Because she's coming in for training in j- 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 January, I think. I think so. I think January, but that training seminar was a few months ago. She was 12 weeks old there. Yep. And so add three months now. So she's probably five months, maybe six months old now. So Mm -hmm. like I said, a little bit slower, but now she's rocking it. So breed does make a little bit of a difference on just when they mature. But what you're asking is how you can continue socializing them to be bold and confident. And that comes back to, like I said, socializing them, letting them experience lots of new environments. Don't coddle them when they are interacting with those environments. If yeah. they See, that was my step number one is don't coddle your dog. Yes. Step number one. And by coddle, we mean things like, oh, it's okay, puppy. Or if they act unsure, you say, or they oh, get startled. I'll, I'll pet you and tell you that you're okay and you're going to help you through this. And what people miss with that is that with uh, people, you know, it's to an extent it works, right? So, but it's more of an adult type of thing, right? If you act unsure in a situation, you are an adult and you are here. And if I say, oh, it's all right, hon, you know, I mean, you'll get through this or whatever. You can understand and comprehend what's going on here. If my little boy, who's a toddler, um, baby stubs his toe and I make a big fuss out of the deal, 
then he expects that that's kind of a requirement. And the same thing happens with the dogs. So we have a little puppy and they do something. And this happened in the puppy send home. And I don't mean to pick because if she's watching, she'll know exactly who she was. She went to set a puppy down and the puppy slipped. And I'm talking like here to here, six inches, slipped, plopped on its side more, got a baby stinger in its back leg. And it's like- Hit his funny bone. Yep, hit his funny bone. And he's kind of like gimping around. And she goes, oh my gosh. And she tries to pick him up. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Ah, da, da. Well, sure, she feels a little bad, whatever. But it's one of those things that the- there was nothing wrong with him. And I said, whoa, 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 don't touch him. Give him a second. He'll walk it off. He'll be done with it in 15 seconds. And he was. He was back to romping around and playing. He said it was just a stinger. He hit his funny bone, whatever. He was the same kind of concept here. And if we coddle those situations, they kind of grow to that where everything in life needs to be coddled. Yep, everything needs to be coddled. If I'm unsure, I should act unsure because then I get rewarded through It's reinforcement-based training. You say, oh, it's okay, buddy. You know, a little putt, nice talking, those kind of things. It's the same way that we reward our dogs in other situations in life. So essentially, we're rewarding them for being unsure. Yes. Or... It happens the same thing with aggression. It happens the same thing with everything. But it's anytime you're trying to comfort your dog, you're essentially rewarding them for the behavior. And that's the way that we look at it. So don't do that. So don't coddle your puppy. Step one. Work on mental and physical stimulation in a sense of training, growing their brains, and then exposing them to as many new environments that you can while they are um, young. You have to be careful if they haven't been fully vaccinated to avoid some of those high populated dog areas, but new environments and new things can be simple. Going up and down stairs, walking across hardwood floors, Going through tall Carpet, grass. tile, any different textures are important. Yeah, right? different textures, car rides. I mean, all things that you can do with your puppy that doesn't risk exposing them to, you know, a dog park type of situation. And then the opposite end of that, we talked a lot about the puppy coming with you. And then there is part of the puppy not coming with you, learning to spend some time alone. They're raised in a litter. They spend all their time with their litter mates and their mom. And then they get separated from that. And it's new. It's a change. And if you become their new litter and you're always together and you do all these things together, they never learn how to be apart. And it's an important thing for them to learn as young dogs. I mean, they need to understand it's okay to be alone. And then it's just as okay to be with my people. Because they're will most likely come a time where they have to be boarded or they're going off for training and they're not going to be with you constantly. And if they have never experienced that before, that at an older age is going to be really traumatic for them. So socializing them and socializing sounds like, oh, we're getting together and having a good time and chit-chatting around a bonfire. Let's get some kids, some little kids out here to chase around and scream and hoop and holler at my puppy. Yeah, and socializing to us means more exposing them to new environments and new things, making sure they're a well-rounded dog, which involves having some alone time in the crate, Um, going on some walks, you know, being okay um, with other training that you're doing, learning to stay on a dog bed. All of those things are great ways to continue developing your puppy. Give him some time. He's going to settle in, feel comfortable with you, and then just start walking with him. He's going to get exploratory come back, say, hey, mom, I'm checking in with you, which is a great thing. A cooperative dog is a really nice thing to have. But then you don't have to talk to him constantly of like, get out of here, go, go, go. Because every time you say something to Jackson, that's going to pull his focus back to you. So just ignore him. Let him wander around. He comes back in, checks in with you. Cool. Let him wander off again. Very well said. Thanks, honey. Well, that part three went a little longer than our normal amount of 20 minute time, but we're going to have to call that an end because guess what? I'm out of bourbon. And we need to pack for Alaska still. And I haven't done that. And we leave tomorrow morning. So. And we're out of time. We're out of time. I'm the guy with the pink gun. I'm Kat, the dog trainer. And we will see you in the next video.